Hey, it's Sam Patrick Regan here from Kintsugi Hope, and I'm recording this talk for the um, guests of Spring Harvest. Um, I've been involved in Spring Harvest over many years, and I've always uh, really, really appreciated the amount of hard work and passion that goes into the theme every single year. And, uh, and, and you guys might not know, but there are meetings that go on, um, lasting days to grapple with theology, to grapple with this stuff. And the theme of Church Unleashed has just seemed to have been so relevant um, at this time. And so, so grateful and so grateful to the Spring Harvest guests. I've um, met some of you guys over the years and uh, just met the most inspirational people. And I love the fact that we're coming from different denominations different backgrounds, different cultures, and Spring Harvest is about embracing that. It's about embracing our differences and, uh, and learning together and realizing not one denomination is it. In fact, if there isn't it, it is about when we come together and love and serve and learn, uh, uh, disagree well, um, and still love each other. And uh, so Spring Harvest is unique, I think, in bringing that. And uh, so I wanted um, to share uh, on this topic today of journeying with others during a crisis. And all the, um, I guess, the material, theology, thoughts, stories um, will come from um, these two books, um, Honesty Over Silence, and when faith gets shaken. And uh, um, these seem to be particularly relevant um, for this time. Um, looking at emotional, mental health, it's okay not to be okay. And a little bit of a theology of suffering, I guess. Where is God when suffering enters our world? So um, please, please check them out. Um, there's DVDs as well, in case you're not into reading. Um, I'm not a great reader, and uh, so you can check that out. And uh, they're on our website. If you get them from our website, then actually, um, all the income comes into the charity to help us support people with emotional and mental health. If you get it from a very big uh, website beginning with A, that doesn't tend to happen. Um, so do check that out and other Christian bookshops that are doing an amazing job at this time as well would be really good. Um, people often say, what does the word kintsugi mean? And uh, kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. Uh, if you get a bowl and you break it, we tend to mend it with super glue and we hide the cracks. What they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique. And, uh, and I think that's the same for our lives, that beauty comes from brokenness. And, uh, and you know, our scars are not there to be ashamed of. Our scars make us who we are. And uh, we've also got a very precious friend, um, Catherine, who is an acoustic artist. And uh, she's made these pendants for us. Every single one is bespoke, is individually made. Um, and you probably can't see it too well on camera, but they're incredible and uh, so, so beautiful. And the scars of our lives not to be hidden for they make us who we are. So again, if you want to get one of these um, for a friend who's going through a tough time, Catherine's mum died recently of the coronavirus and, uh, and I know these mean a lot to us and a lot to her as well. Um, so that'd be good. Journey with others in a crisis. Um, I really want to look today at Luke 24 and uh, a very, very common passage. I'm not going to read it all out. It's very long, and, uh, uh, but it's an amazing story. The road to Emmaus. And I want to describe what's going on here in this crisis moment and, uh, and look at how this can help us in uh, teaching others and journeying with others at this time. So obviously Jesus um, has come back from the dead and, and here you have a number of characters in this, um, Cleopas um, and his wife Mary. Now many believe that Mary um, was uh, with uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Madeline um, at the crucifixion, John 19 verse 25. If that was the case, and most people believe this probably is Mary with Cleopas, is that she would have heard the cries from the cross. She would have seen the spear that went into Jesus' side. She would have known something of the pain, the heartache, the agony, the anxiety, the humiliation, the betrayal in the passion story up to this point. And I think this is fascinating. I love this story. So what would Jesus do the first morning after his resurrection? The first thing he does is he travels with two heartbroken people and walks alongside them. And the first of my three reflections really is, is we need to be alongside at this time, side by side. You can do things to people, you can do things for people, or you work 
with people and among people. And the fascinating thing about Jesus in this passage is as they start walking alongside and they start describing what's happened and um, you know, Jesus doesn't say, you know, here's about all what's going on and, and the fact that the Messiah, you know, the, the, who they thought was the Messiah was being put to death and their plans and their hopes and their aspirations and everything they were dreaming of. Um, because they probably wanted and uh, saw Jesus as a prophet. They wanted him to bring the second exodus. They wanted um, liberation from the Romans. You know, the Israelites had been invaded, hadn't they, by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians. Now the Romans ruling over them. They wanted a military messiah. They wanted a messiah, a bit like the Judah Maccabee character who um, rode in a force into Jerusalem. And uh, that desire for a military messiah. And uh, they start describing their heartache. And, uh, and Jesus listens, and he just doesn't jump in and go, guys, it's all right. Da-da, I'm Jesus, it's all good. Stop the conversation. He just listens. I am rubbish at listening, I have to admit. And sometimes when people are telling me really tough stuff, I want to jump in with a solution. I want to fix them. And I've realized that sometimes people don't want to be fixed, they want to be loved. People start to heal the moment they feel hurt. Uh, my daughter, Abby, um, she's got a condition called nystagmus. Um, it's an eyesight condition. She has sort of 40% vision and it leads to, she's got some other complex additional needs, which is making homeschooling at the moment really challenging for all of us. I've got four kids. And, uh, but nystagmus, it reduces uh, vision and depth perception, uh, affects his balance coordination. So often every mealtime there's a drink knocked over. Um, it's got involuntary eye movement, so her eyes flicker quite a lot. And she wouldn't mind me sharing this. And uh, um, I came downstairs the other day and she's crying, really crying. And she's with Diane, my wife. And I'm like, what's happened? And Diane turns to me and she says, uh, it's Abby. She's a little bit sad about her eyesight. And I went in to fix it mode. I went into Abby, it's okay because there's going to be this new equipment that comes out. We're going to buy it somehow. We're going to get this medical professional to, to um, get this for you. And, and then Diane was like, Patrick, stop. She doesn't need loads of solutions at this moment. She just needs a dad. She needs a hug. She needs you to be her dad. Jesus in this story allowed them to share their story. And then what I love about it is even at that point, he doesn't go, da-da, I'm Jesus, woohoo. He starts sharing a bigger story. He starts sharing how their story fits into the bigger story, the story of God. In Kintsugi Hope, we often talk about holding space for people. I don't know what you think about when you hold space for someone. I love this definition. It says this, to hold space for someone. It means that we're willing to walk alongside another person in whatever journey they're on without judging them making them feel inadequate, trying to fix them, or trying to impact the outcome. When we hold space for other people, we open our hearts, offer unconditional support, and let go of judgment and control. So often, we've told people who are struggling that it's their lack of faith, or it's their sin, or they've done something wrong. And uh, I've had people come up to me, uh, I remember people coming up to me at places like Spring Harvest saying, you know, oh my goodness, I think I'm struggling with depression, I'm crying every day, and this is really, really tough, and I don't know what to do. And I told my pastor, and my pastor said to me, I hear no faith in your comments whatsoever. And then they feel even worse for not having faith. And, and I've said to people, you know, actually, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not an expert in anything I don't feel like but maybe you should go to your doctor, maybe you should ask, you know, and see if you can get some support around you. And it's almost like, really? And I went, yeah, of course. You know, we need to listen, we need to understand. And uh, we don't want to be the experts, but we can provide love and care and community. It's really interesting because, um, you know, a friend of mine said this, is that when someone's got cancer, um, we expect the medical professionals to provide chemo and radiotherapy and um, all the stuff that they need to get through medically. Um, and they need all that stuff. And we, we can't do what the medical experts can't, can. We can't, I can't do what professional qualified psychologists and counsellors, I wouldn't even dream of trying. Um, they have their expertise, which is incredible. But you know what we can provide in the cancer scenario? We can provide love and support and community and a listening ear and prayer. And we have an amazing opportunities. People are lonely. Before the coronavirus, the two biggest issues facing 
the um, church? Well, they said the three biggest issues actually were family breakdown, loneliness, and mental health. And, uh, and just a report out on the BBC yesterday um, was saying that well-being is probably at the lowest it's been in this country for a very long time. And mental health and poverty are actually going to be two of the biggest issues that we're going to face. And, uh, and I think the challenge with that is for me, particularly around the whole area of journey and with my mental health, it's just been shame. I just felt ashamed. I felt embarrassed. I would never dreamt in a million years that I would do a video to the guys at Spring Harvest and other people um, talking about this. Uh, I, not in my wildest dreams. But I realized that shame is believing that I'm wrong. Guilt is I've done something wrong. Guilt can push you to be a better person, but shame is believing I'm wrong. Um, Brené Brown says, shame is saying you're not enough and who do you think you are? She says, shame loves silence, secrecy and judgment, but shame can't stand empathy. Empathy towards others and empathy towards ourselves. My story is um, uh, many years ago now, everything went pear-shaped in my life. Um, Kezia, my daughter, got a condition called HSP. Um, she had spots. It was like a meningitis rash, it looked like, on her legs. And it was just awful. And uh, she had it three times. And it was one of those conditions where the doctor was like, if she gets a temperature or she's sick, rush her into uh, A&E. And I remember Christmas Eve and another night we rushed into A&E. And there's nothing worse than when your kid is sick and you're powerless to do anything. You feel completely out of control. Around the same time, I got a news that I needed to get both my legs broken in three places and a circular frame attached to my leg with 12 pins going through my leg, six of which would be drilled into my bone. Um, this big external frame would have to be on six months to a year. My friend was like, mate, that must be waiting for a car accident to happen. And uh, it had to be done at different times. And, you know, I love football and I love playing football. And I knew when I walked out of the hospital, I'd never be able to do that ever again. I wouldn't be able to run again. Abby got diagnosed with a nystagmus condition. Um, we had uh, wanted another baby. We thought we'd better get on with it. And uh, um, I know for dying, that was the most tragic time in our life when we, we lost the baby. And it was just like everything was caving around me. And being in the Christian world and the Christian culture, to be honest with you, was pretty hard. Um, everyone knew about my leg stuff. Everyone wanted to pray for me. Um, the famous visiting American speaker at all the festivals um, would take me into the back room somewhere and pray for me. And, uh, and when I didn't get healed, I was told that I didn't have enough faith. I tried to muster up faith. I really did. Uh, someone else told me Christian leaders are the worst to pray for because you're rubbish at receiving. Another person told me that God's backed me into a corner. God's going to use his time to help me rest. Um, and just think of all the time that you're going to have on your hands to pray. And I went into the Operate In Theatre. It was the most weird thing, walking to hospital, knowing that I wouldn't walk again for a very long time. And, uh, and you can see a picture here of my frame. And it makes me look a bit like Robocop. Um, people are like, you've got four kids. How did your kids cope? Here's a picture of Daniel doing Star Wars Lego on my frame. We turned it into a space station. And then there was Christmas. Here's Abigail. And uh, turned it into a Christmas tree. But my confidence had been shaken. I have to be honest. And just before I went into hospital, I wrote a blog post called When Faith Gets Shaken. And in it, I was really honest. And I told the story of Mother Teresa. Uh, someone went up to Mother Teresa and said, will you pray for me? And she's like, of course I pray for you. What do you want prayer for? And she's, uh, he said, I want prayer for clarity. And Mother Teresa went, no, not praying for that. And he's like, well, you've always seemed to have clarity. And Mother Teresa said this, I've never had clarity about anything I've ever done. All I've ever had is trust. So I pray that you will be able to trust. What followed then was, oh my goodness, I had, it was one of those weird things. It was just read by thousands and thousands of people. And um, I had people contacting me who were going through chemotherapy, um, 37 year old who had leukemia, and two young children, heart surgery, um, uh, and a wife had limpus cancer, um, panic disorders. And they all said this, I've never read anything from a Christian before that's so honest. And, uh, and I turned the blog post into the book, When Faith Gets Shaken, and, uh, and some of the things that I started to discuss seemed to really hit home with people, and this is something I had to come to a conclusion with, is that so often I felt judged and put down because of my anxiety. And uh, anxiety for me has been pretty tough in this last month. I don't know if that's too honest, but it, I don't know. It's been, I know it's been hard for lots of people. Me, it's been really hard. And I came to this conclusion. I love this quote. Anxiety isn't weakness. Living with anxiety, turning up, doing stuff with anxiety 
takes a strength most of us will never know. I would love you to watch this video from the brilliant Brené Brown. Um, I think this is genius. And this is looking, and this is such an important lesson, particularly now, the difference between empathy and sympathy. And uh, check this out. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. We have a Messiah that walks alongside us. You know, I love this, um, this story, and, uh, um, and I love this quote. It says this, when someone is broken, don't try and fix them. You can't. When someone's hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain. You can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in their hurt. You can. Because sometimes what people need is simply to know they're not on their own. So me and Diane, um, we started um, Kintsugi Hope, and we started this 12-step um, program, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, but around well-being, looking at issues around anger and self-acceptance and anxiety and stigma and resilience and forgiveness, all, all amazing topics, disappointment, loss. And, uh, and we delivered it in small groups across the country. It was trained, I don't know, 186 people up already, and it's moved online. Um, I thought, oh my goodness, this will be a disaster. Um, it's actually worked better than um, we ever dreamt of. People now train online, they're running it all over the country, um, reaching out to neighbors, to friends. You know, the country's in WhatsApp groups, aren't they? Um, and social media and Facebook. Um, it's so easy to invite people to a well-being group now, run by your local church. Um, people are absolutely loving it. And, uh, and of course, the beauty thing, after 12 weeks, people are like, oh, I'd quite like to stay now. Um, and so people are staying part of small groups and home groups and cell groups because you belong before you believe. And there's been something really beautiful about it. But when we first started it, I remember uh, some of the questions that I got. First question, um, I, get, I bet you can guess what it is. Um, the first question is, uh, yeah, yeah, this is all well and good, Patrick, um, well-being and all that sort of stuff. When do we preach at them? You know, that's what they were saying. When do we sock it to them? Because I don't just want to talk about you know, this stuff without talking about God and all that sort of stuff. And I'd always say to people, hear my heart, hear my heart on this. There is nothing more loving 
than you, what you can do than to tell people about Jesus. There's nothing more loving than that. It's one of Kintsugi Hope's outcomes. It's the reason we don't get loads of money. <laughs> um, the reason secular funders get nervous about us. Um, the issue for me is how. I believe the answer is in storytelling. I think the answer is not divorcing spirituality from emotional, mental, physical, spiritual health. It's holistic. It's the whole thing. So it's really interesting. Um, on the first week of our Kintsugi group, Diane talks about honesty. And she says, you know, honestly, the hardest part of my life is when I had that miscarriage. And, uh, and faith is really important to me, but I, it wobbled. But I prayed, and that was the only thing that got me through. We had the most beautiful conversation about faith. There was another week on forgiveness, <laughs> and uh, uh, a friend of ours went, huh, you Christians, you have to forgive everyone, don't you? Can you explain that to the rest of the group, please? And she looked at me. And uh, at that point, I looked at Diane and went, you know what, I've been wondering about that as well. Could you explain it to the rest of the group? I got one of those deaf stares, you know, the stare that only a wife can give a husband. Jesus told stories, stories that people could relate to. Why were they about fishing and about farming? It's because people understood the context. And I can guarantee you that people will start to open up when you tell stories. In fact, you know, a, a neighbor of ours, um, she came along uh, the, after 12 weeks. Um, what are you doing next week? We're doing Jonah. Have you ever tried to st describe the story of Jonah to a non-Christian? It just sounds a bit weird, to be honest. And she's like, I'd love to carry on coming. Um, shame dies when stories are told in safe places. The second thing about this story, the road to Emmaus, is I think it challenges, I don't think, I know, it challenges our priorities. The morning after the resurrection, what should Jesus do? Maybe a big meeting. Let's get the message out. You know, let's um, have a marketing strategy here. What Jesus does the morning after the resurrection, he walks alongside a Palestinian peasant couple who have no status and no influence. He walks alongside them. As part of my former job, I used to do a lot of, uh, go to a lot of these fundraising meals. And uh, sometimes I was the speaker, um, and other times I was just there as part of it. And it's really interesting in these fundraising meals, because what happens is, is you go in and you've got canapes and, uh, and, uh, and drinks, orange juice or champagne or something like that. And then everyone's trying to suss everyone out. And you get these people that will come up to you and go, um, you know, hey, what do you do? And what they're trying to do, actually, is they're trying to work out if you have influence or money often. And of course, I'm always the charity guy. I'm the guy who actually wants their money. And, uh, and as soon as they work out that you have neither influence or money, they just sort of drop you and their gaze goes somewhere else. And, and off they go. They always get a bit of a shock then when I stand up and do the main talk. But you know, the issue is Jesus didn't go for the people that had influence. He went to the broken, the last, the lost, and the least. And, uh, and I think as a society, if this time of the coronavirus can teach us anything, it's that we've had our priorities wrong. We've put things before people. Abby, who already mentioned, um, when it comes to the end of term, you have the assembly. And uh, um, all these other kids, get, they get 100% attendance certificates. Um, Abby will never get that because there's too many hospital appointments to go and attend. And I sort of see her looking at all her friends getting 100% attendance certificates. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I sort of understand it. But I'm like, that's never going to be an option for her. You know, the interesting thing, isn't it, and the really challenging thing about the church going online is we did it quick. I think 53,000, I don't know what it was, churches went online, bang, like that. And some have done it with great technology and some have done it with their phones, but we did it. And yet, you know, there's a whole um, group of society who've been crying out for us to do that for a long time. People that have got ME, people that have got disabilities, people that can't get to church. You know, we have to think about accessibility. Um, you know, I, recently in Kintsugi Hope, we've been talking to people from the deaf community, realizing there isn't much around faith and mental health out there at all, yet there's a huge issue in the deaf community. We cannot go back to just doing it the way we used to do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't meet together. I actually really miss people, you know, preaching in an empty church, it's, 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 it's weird. Um, I want to get back with people. I miss people. I miss hearing people laugh. I hear, miss people um, uh, talking. And I just miss it. And, uh, 
but we can't go back. We can't exclude. You know, um, the thing about Abigail is in her end of year report, she got A for effort in every single subject, and yet she'll probably never get a GCSE. We have to challenge our values. We need to um, realize that we have put programs before people, stats before learning, charisma before character, achievement before kindness. We've got to go back to doing the right thing. We've got to go back to grappling. What does success look like? I remember my um, counsellor, um, who is so lovely and gracious with me, and I check in with her. I um, used to see her regularly, but check in with her quite re- uh, sort of once a month, and, uh, which is sort of great for me. And I remember her challenging me, going, Patrick, what's actually important to you? What's really, really important to you? And normally, counsellors, you know, you want them to give you the answer, and they never do. It's a bit annoying after a while, to be honest. And you're like, just tell me what to do! And then they ask you some more questions. And uh, this one time, I remember she going, I think success to you is following your heart. Is even when you're unpopular, even when you say that thing that isn't popular, if you know God is saying it, that's the most important. It's about showing up. It's about okay, about being broken. It's knowing that you've got nothing to prove. And it's about living in line with your values. And I think challenging our values at this time, how we treat people, how we journey with people in a crisis, it's not about watering anything down. It's about communicating more passionately than we've ever communicated. I love this quote. The plain fact is this, this planet does not need more successful people, but it desperately needs more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage, willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as we've defined it. Jesus says to an insignificant peasant couple, you are significant. And he says, you're part of the story and you're part of this story. The last thing I wanna say about this is as Jesus um, starts to talk to them, and you see it here in the scriptures so, so beautifully, he tells them the big story, the big story of God. And Jesus breaks bread with these exhausted and hopeless travelers, and and, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus was gonna go on, and it's them that say, come on, have a meal with us. And suddenly, as he breaks the bread, clear pass, He gets it. I get who you are. I know who you are. And I love this. Brokenness reveals who Jesus is. People connect much more of your uh, scars and your success stories. And uh, and we need to understand, you need to understand that you're part of the story. Um, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, famous theologian, says that if you could see the Bible as a five-act play, um, he says this, Act one, creation and the fall. Act two, the people of God. God longing to know them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Philip Yancey, I love this, says, if he could rename the Bible, he'd rename it, God gets his family back. (laughs) I really think that's really cool. Um, Act three, Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Act four, the history of the church, the ministry of Paul and the apostles. Act five, the end of the story, Revelation 21. No more pain, no more suffering. Um, Every tear will be wiped away. So he says, where are we in the story? He says, well, where we're in the story, we are act four, scene two. Because act four, scene one's been written. It's the act of the apostles. It's the Pentecost. Act four, scene two, we have to faithfully improvise the story. Our behavior has to be consistent with the plot so far. The plot so far of God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. You can only improvise the story when you know the story. And that's why when we come together and grapple with this sort of stuff, it's so important. We are God's children. We are part of the story. We're in the picture. The gospel is the story of Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. I get scared sometimes that we've turned personal salvation into the gospel. It's all about numbers. It's all about the stats. It's all about that hand in the air at the end of the meeting. Do not get me wrong. Personal salvation is amazing. But the gospel is bigger. If we think that Jesus' narrative is no more than answering the question, how do I get to heaven, then we have nothing to say until that person asks that question. But what if the story is wider? What if the gospel has something to say to the questions? You know what? My friend died of coronavirus. Um, I've got people in a care home and I can't go and see them. I was a victim of child abuse. I'm a parent. I'm struggling with my teenage kids. I'm struggling with my younger kids. 
the gospel has something to say to all these things. Maybe God is calling us to dive into these questions, to wrestle with them, and Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit. And uh, I want to show you this little video clip now. This is my favorite little video clip. Uh, I say that about every video clip. May I notice that? Um, but it's basically of a grandfather who's got an iPad, and his daughter's bought it. His his um his daughter uh, has bought it for him, and uh, and just see the way he uses it. Check this out. You can use an iPad for that. Um, it's probably a little bit of a waste of money, to be honest. Um, but because you, you're missing out on all the things the iPad can do, and sometimes if we make the gospel so small, we're missing out on what it gospel is all about the transformation of society we come back to this meal luke is showing the first meal of the new creation the first meal ever in genesis brought a curse this meal is about entering into a new beginning the now and the not yet jesus takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it and their eyes are open to a whole new world that's what we want to see happen and that's why for Kintsugi Hope, the most important thing is how do we journey with others? And, uh, and my prayer is, whether it's through online well-being groups, whether it's through all the other amazing charities, that you would find a way of journeying through others. I want to show you um, a 50-second video now uh, on the whole Kintsugi thing. So in conclusion, are we journeying with others? And my encouragement is be brave. Be brave. Um, let's reach out to those people. Let's um, say to people, you know what? Um, if it's about the well-being stuff, we invest in our physical health. We have to go out for exercise every day at the moment. And hopefully when lockdown finishes and gyms and sport is open, we will invest in our physical health. But let's invest in our mental health as well. Let's tell our stories. Let's step out of shame. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Proverbs 11 verse 21 says this, anyone can find the dirt in someone, be the one that finds the gold. Let's challenge our values. What does success look like to you? Are we too busy? Um, maybe we need to change. Maybe we need a real cultural change. And thirdly, is remember you're part of this bigger story. You're significant, you're not hidden. And Maya Angelou says this, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you make them feel. I wanna say that if you feel forgotten at this time, if you're struggling at this time, or if life is fantastic, is that God sees you. And, uh, and he pursues you. He knows you are not hidden from God. And uh, this is a beautiful song by uh, Lauren Daigle, which talks about um, the fact that God is coming after you. Um, God bless you. Please get in touch with us at Kintsugi Hope. Check out the resources and the wellbeing groups. That's helpful. But please know that you are loved and that you are enough. Mm-hmm.